some exciting moments. Several of us are, are trying to adjust our screens and get ready for a web, um, sorry, a Zoom webinar. The first of our meetings, our first of our public meetings to deal with the Covington Maple Valley Aquatics Recreation Center Feasibility Study. So how exciting, I know we'll adjust a shaving, a setting our settings so that hopefully people are getting comfortable with a virtual meeting being convened. This meeting is being convened by both cities with the assistance of um, a professional consultant team led by ALSC Architects. Uh, I happen to be Matthew Keogh and an employee at the City of Covington working on behalf of both cities. So pleased that we were able to gather tonight our 15 member steering committee for this project. So pleased to think that there are a number of people listening in on the public meeting and realizing that their input also counts. We will be working to get to community understanding. And I sometimes use the big word community consensus together and it will only work through interaction. So we hope that the public members know that they can raise questions today. They can certainly make comments on Facebook and track this project from start to end. Every, every item that we have in front of the steering committee is also in front of the public. We wanna make sure you know that and how to participate. But the fact that you're here tonight, um, again, it just really speaks to the fact that we have set a priority on talking about indoor recreation, what we can do, what is feasible. I hope you knew that that's what we were up to at recreateandrecreate.com. That happens to be our project page and that you've been getting excited along with us and our 15 member steering committee gathered tonight. So again, I, um, I just have the pleasure of convening this group and um, then turning off my mic and hopefully listening and really getting the benefit of, of the collective knowledge in the, uh, in the room or in the virtual room. Um, but if, uh, if I can, I'd love to just challenge everyone tonight. I'd like to give you the challenge of dialogue. It's the value that I think the study needs to speak to and um, needs to deliver on. And what I wanna ask you to do, because I'm talking about dialogue and interaction and you engaging, I want you to pause now and I want you steering committee members particularly, but the public too, but steering committee members to think through what you're listening to tonight, the first half of the meeting, there's probably more listening than where you, than any of us really want. But as you're listening, I want you to think through what is the value that is really important to me that I think really needs to come out of this study. I want us to become outcome thinkers, people who are thinking to what point, to what goal am I here? And I really wanna be able at the end of our four meetings say I did stand up for that. So that's your big challenge folks. I just gave you my example of dialogue. I, it's a single word, you might come up with more than one word, but I want you and I'm gonna challenge my steering committee members to report back to me what outcome, what goal you really wanna stand for in this process. And I'll be forgiving if it doesn't start with the right letter, but I'm going to give you a little structure. I told you before, I'm a little bit like a cruise director here and I want fun. So the challenge I'm gonna give you guys is to think not only broadly about what you stand for and what value you think this, this study needs to deliver, but to try to do so in a way that we can all look at it together and end up spelling out the word feasibility study. It could be a really boring word, right? Feasibility study, but we're gonna bring that alive through you and through your participation. So when Rosie does her introductions today, she doesn't have to address this, but since she's the first one on our steering committee alphabetically to speak, I want to see if she can use the letter F from feasibility and maybe come up with a word or something that's really important to her as an outcome for this study. And then Chris, since we mentioned your second feasibility, I know I always spell it wrong, but anyway, it, it's the next letter is E. So I can try to remind you, Chris, or anybody else what letter you have, but we'll be using the um, charter, we'll be using the alphabetical list that happens to be on page two of your group charter. And so, you don't have to publicly say what word it is, but I'm going to want it by break time. In the middle of the meeting today, we do have a break. And at that point, I hope I've gotten your either email or your chat or text, whatever you like, and I get your word. So that maybe by the end of the meeting, we can report back on what we, 16 of us really, 15 steering committee members, and if you'll let me participate with a letter D, dialogue, 
what we came up with, right? So it turns out we have 16 letters available in feasibility study. And I'll help any one of you who don't know what letter you have, but you just need to listen and then report back what you want to see out of this study, if you can, with that letter, right? You guys, does that make any sense at all? I hope so. Great. Um, so we are getting into introductions. That's one of the first things on the agenda. Um, and my pleasure is to introduce to you our moderator. And I've already given him a, a little bit of an introduction, but I will go ahead and turn over now to Rustin Hall of ALSC Architects. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew. And again, thank you all so much. Uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking with each of you with the exception of uh, most recent editions. So we'll certainly get into that. But uh, really briefly, uh, Rustin Hall, principal ALSC architects, uh, been in this business doing this kind of work for 36 years now. Uh, so not, not the first rodeo. And I'm really excited primarily because of having talked to all of you, the, the passion and the enthusiasm you bring to this and knowing, having done so many of these, how many positive impacts projects and studies like this can have on a community. It's uh, kind of why we do what we do. And so thanks again for, for doing this. My role in this, um, I just want to be very clear about this. I'm a little bit of a, somewhere between a, an MC and a taskmaster, meaning we have an agenda. I'm going to go through that here really quickly with you. My role, among other things, is to make sure we get through this uh, in the time frame that's uh, allotted here. So uh, I'll, I'll beg your forgiveness now if I have to say, we're going to take that and put it in the parking lot, which uh, basically means we're going to take anything that might be outside of the conversation that uh, is at hand or for running out of time. We will record those things and certainly deal with them at a later time as soon as we can. But uh, I'm going to get us through all this and honor your time. Uh, we're set up beyond 830. Um, so when, uh, when we're doing that, uh, again, if you uh, have a thought, please put it in the chat. And that way we've got a record of it. If we are not able to address it here, we will certainly address it uh, at a later time as a follow-up. So uh, with that, quickly on the agenda, that's what's on the screen that Drew is uh, sharing with you right now. And by the way, Drew Leeper, uh, he can wave at everybody there. Uh, Drew is our ALSC's project manager for this. So he and I work very much in tandem uh, amongst all of the rest of the consultants uh, in our group here. Uh, you also have here tonight, uh, uh, Michael Dean with uh, DH and Katie in the background, making sure our technology holds up. We've also got uh, Scott with uh, Ballard King, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the, the work done to date there. That's who we've got tonight. We'll introduce the others later on in the process as they uh, present to you. So with that, the agenda really quickly, we're going to start with our intros, walk through a scope of work statement, uh, just to make sure we're, we're all grounded on 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 the same page on what a feasibility study really is about and what we're doing here. Um, we're gonna look at the charter and just touch on a couple of things there, including the mission uh, for the project. Um, at that point, we're gonna turn it over to Dave and Ethan to uh, introduce the, the core planning group and to explain that the dynamics of that and how that process works and uh, those, those reporting uh, protocols. Uh, we'll then talk about the project schedule overall. Uh, and some of those key activities and milestones. Uh, we'll go over some of the work performed to date. Uh, there's been a lot going on. We've been working on this really since the springtime. It's just been on again, off again due to COVID impacts. But again, I'm with Matthew. I'm so delighted that we're finally able to be up on a plane, uh, so to speak, getting this process going uh, uh, in it with, a, with a fervor. I mean, we, we really have great momentum going now. Uh, with that, we'll take a five minute break um, just to stretch our legs and then uh, get right back into the, the main uh, event to speak for the evening, which is talking about our site selection criteria. I know that sounds kind of boring, but it's really important that that's done well and, and done a specific way. So we'll walk through that. You'll see there's a lot of time allotted to that. Uh, we will need probably all of that. And then finally, we'll go through, uh, just review our next uh, steps and what's coming up. I refer back to that schedule because I really want you to anticipate what's coming. Uh, and it's our, our job to make sure you're never guessing on what's coming or what's expected of you uh, as we go through this. Uh, we're gonna ask you for input and some questions uh, for, the, for the group or, or thoughts uh, throughout this. Uh, this is not intended to be a lecture. Uh, this is intended to be very, very interactive. Um, what I'd like to do is get through my piece and, and all of us through our piece quickly and then immediately open that up for questions before we move on. Uh, just again, so that, that we know. So please raise your hand. 
uh, if uh, once we get through that, we ask for feedback and we'll be able to uh, understand who's got, got some thoughts there. Uh, again, congratulations for being selected. There was a lot of folks, a lot of really high quality folks that wanted to be in, involved in this and you're the short list. So uh, congratulations and thanks again. All right, with that, we're gonna go ahead and go to our introductions. Uh, as Matthew noted, we're gonna use the, the charter uh, list that, that's provided and go in alphabetical order. And that means we're gonna start with Rosie and please uh, it, try to keep it to about a minute if you can, I'll, I'll keep that moving. And uh, I believe you've got the letter F from uh, Matthew's charge. Wonderful, thank you. I am uh, very excited to be here. My name is Rosie Bolins. I live in Maple Valley. Um, I've lived in South King County for about seven years now and lived in Maple Valley for about two and a half. Um, I am currently a commissioner on the Maple Valley uh, Parks and Recreation Commission. And um, in my professional life, I am an attorney. Uh, my practice focuses on real estate, land use and municipal law. Um, and so a lot of what I do deals with development um, and a lot of what I do um, and other, other things that we might see in this study. Um, I, in my personal life, am a mom of two little kids. I have two little girls, one is four and one is six. Um, and I am really, I have a vested interest in making sure that this community, um, Maple Valley and Covington and surrounding communities have a, a safe place for kids and families um, to come and gather and recreate. Um, Matthew, I'm gonna, since you um, ambushed us with this task, <laughs> I'm gonna give out two words, but it's one thought. Um, so my F is future focus, because I would like to make sure that we're keeping an eye on the longevity and the long-term goals that we're trying to accomplish today. Excellent, thank you so much. Next on the list, we've got Chris, is it Bristol? Bristol, yes. Bristol, thank you. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. My name is Chris Bristol. Um, lived in Maple Valley for the last seven years. Uh, I have a wife. I have three daughters, one in elementary, one in middle, one in high school in the Tahoma School District. Uh, my career background is in extensive corporate finance. Uh, I started at Disneyland, uh, got recruited up to Nike in Oregon, and then came up here with REI. Uh, and that's uh, an all in the financial planning realm, doing business cases, budgeting, forecasting. Um, uh, my last role at REI was the, the uh, uh, Divisional Vice President of Financial Planning and Analysis. Um, I left REI to actually explore some small businesses, one of which was actually something like this, believe it or not. Um, so I have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge I've acquired since uh, leaving the workforce about um, what can make some of these types of facilities uh, successful. So we can get to that stuff later. Uh, I'm just super excited to be a part of this um, and to be able to lend some expertise. And, and um, as I was tasked with the letter E, uh, the one that popped to me uh, was about exploration. And what I mean by that is I've done enough feasibility studies that it's not about getting to a yes, it's about getting to explore all the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and it might be a no, and that could be a successful feasibility study. Um, so right. I'm excited to be there. And then lastly, the thing that popped out to me on those, on those is really the community piece. It's easy to just look at this as an aquatic or an athletic facility, but there was a ton of comments in there about a place to gather, a place to meet. And I think that's a super important thing we got to keep our eye on. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Next, we've got uh, Les Burberry. And you're Hi, the letter A. All right. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, I am Les Burberry. I'm a here in Maple Valley. Um, my professional day job is I am a regional manager for AAA Washington and I manage insurance agents and operations uh, in the southern half of Washington. Um, I uh, have uh, married uh, with six children that uh, we raised here in the city of Maple Valley. Uh, lived in Maple Valley continuously for a little over 21 years, and actually 23 years. And um, we, we actually first moved into Maple Valley 30 years ago, uh, lived in Renton for just a short period of time. Um, I, in my A, with my A, I would say act according to my constituents' wishes. And I know that 
an indoor recreation facility has been high on the list of our citizens for a long time. And so I am just excited and elated to be able to uh, uh, you know, study this uh, uh, possibility. And I think the other, other piece is uh, I, I look at community as a verb and a noun. And uh, I think that this indoor rec recreation facility will be able to bring uh, community uh, in our, uh, on our, in our community. And so uh, excited about that. All right, excellent. Les, thank you so much. Next, we've got uh, Brock, uh, is it Dealey? Do we have Brock out there? All right, we will come back to, to Brock. Um, he has got the letter S. So uh, moving I'm sorry. on. I'm available. Are you ready? Oh, there he is. Okay. And it is DD. It should be a D, not an L. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry, sir. We'll fix that. So um, I'm Brock Didi. I'm from Black Diamond. Uh, so I'm not part of the Maple Valley um, Covington deal, but um, I am a neighbor and uh, hopefully can give you, give you some input from our community. I did graduate from Tahoma in 1983. So I, uh, I lived in Maple Valley for most of my uh, uh, education life, uh, third grade through 12th grade. Um, now I'm in Black Diamond and uh, married with the city council one, woman. And um, we have four kids that have all um, graduated from high school and two in college and two out in the world. Um, uh, I work at Boeing, I think I told you that, but what I do um, for the community of Black Diamond is I run our Black Diamond gym, our city gym. And most of that is uh, scheduling uh, basketball teams or volleyball teams to utilize the, our indoor facility um, here, in Black, here in Black Diamond. Not a lot of people know about it, um, but it is getting a lot of use now that the COVID scare is uh, kind of over. Um, one thing that I saw a lot of in the comments were uh, the different things that would be nice to have available in the gym. And uh, that's kind of what we have is some things that um, a pool doesn't have is, you know, a basketball court, uh, um, a stage and uh, av av ability to put up a net and play volleyball. So we do have those opportunities here in Black Diamond. So um, that's something that we can build off of um, in this uh, new uh, opportunity that we're looking at. I, I do have the S, I guess. Um, so I think um, another thing that um, I saw a lot in the comments was the ability to get the point out to the people. So, um, and social media is a big part of that. So um, uh, I like the word, I mean, I, I thought of socializing, um, but um, social success might be uh, a, good, a good term for S. So All right. they use that. So thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, we've got, uh, next up is, uh, Moni Dami with the letter I. Hi, everybody. My name is Moni. I have been living in Covington for G since COVID hit. So I don't know many people here, but we moved up here in March from Auburn. Um, I have two kids. They are five and three. So I'm always busy. My professional background is I'm a recreation therapist with the uh, Department of Veteran Affairs. I am tasked with um, making or developing rather whole health, holistic health, uh, community integration programs for veterans with PTSD, substance abuse, and anything mental health related. So that is what I do. And I also am the liaison between recreation programs, community-wide, veteran-wide, and then the VA itself. Um, the word or the letter I have is um, I, and I, I immediately thought about inclusion. And when I think about inclusion, I think about not just including, uh, you know, different people, but it's different people with different abilities, different backgrounds, di multi-generational. Um, so I picked inclusion. And something that, uh, you know, other folks have been talking about what stand out to me and others here is um, that folks here want a family-oriented, you know, facility that's 
user friendly and that's multi generational user friendly actually so that's what stands out to me i'm extremely excited recreation is my passion and my profession so um, i'm i'm very happy that i was selected thanks well fantastic thank you so much all right we've got sarah duffy clinton with the letter b uh, hi, I'm, I'm very excited to be um, chosen as part of this committee and, and, and really looking forward to kind of the discussions and where this leads. Um, I've been with the, uh, living in Maple Valley for six years now. Before that, um, my family and I lived back east in western New York, um, and I grew up um, in a YMCA. So I, I understand the importance of uh, community and, and working and, and, and having something where people can go and, and uh, swim and play basketball and, and just meet others. Um, you know, I, I, am, I was a swimmer growing up. So, you know, the water is very important. Water safety is very important. I have three children, um, 10, eight and four. And so, you know, it's, it's important to have something like that for, for not only my kids and other kids in the, in, in the communities. Um, I, but I think it's also important to think about, you know, what we're doing uh, as, as Mani had discussed, really to think about how to, to make this useful for all um, in the community and um, how how to best utilize uh, the money and the space and and um, you know uh, for you know so that it is being utilized uh, throughout the day and the evenings. Um, so I, you know I'm really looking forward to this. I am a full, I work full time. I'm in healthcare uh, and I work in research. So I've been very busy during this COVID time, um, but. Um, you know, it's it's really exciting to kind of think about something that <laughs> can happen and getting everybody back together again. And so as, as along the same lines, uh, I had B, which I thought about um, bringing communities together because I think that's really kind of the focus of this group um, and, and what we're all here to do. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Ed Holmes with the letter I. Yeah, uh, so my name's Ed Holmes. I have lived in Covington for about three years now in the area for five, lived in the Hobart Maple Valley area before that. Um, I am on the board of directors for Covington's chamber as well as on the economic development committee, uh, committee for Covington as well. And then in my professional life, I'm a pastor. I am the executive pastor at Real Life Church, um, which is just right in the heart of Covington. Um, what I found really interesting about the survey results was just the really diverse options people are looking for from uh, recreational opportunities outside of just a traditional pool and gym like trails and rock climbing walls and things like that. And then the other thing that really stuck out to me is it looks like people are just really looking for an opportunity to do things community based with their family, um, which is a big deal for me. Um, when it comes to my letter I, the um, inclusion was the first one that popped up to me, but many you grabbed that. Um, so I, I pivoted to the idea of intentional. I think it's going to real take it's going to take some real intentional thought for us to uh, not slip into developing a, a recreational facility that just looks and mimics the other ones we've seen when it looks like our community is asking for more. So yeah, great, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, with the letter L, we've got Linda Johnson. Good evening. Uh, I have lived in Covington for 20 years, and then I moved to Maple Valley and have been here for 25 years. I work for the federal government, spending your tax dollars. I was the contracting officer with General Services Administration. I retired in 2004 when I w took office with the Maple Valley City Council. So I've been around, I'm starting my fifth term. So that's 17 years that I've been in the community and knowing our citizens and what they want and just trying to serve them the best I can. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. My L word is lively discussion and I don't think that's gonna be any kind of a problem. <laughs> I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. So thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, all right. Uh, once again, with the letter I, we've got uh, Marita. Yes, I have the third I. <laughs> uh, 
I'm uh, Marita Ledesma. Hello, everybody. I have lived in Covington for about four years now in Washington for five. And I currently serve as the chair of the Covington Arts Commission. Um, in my professional life, I work for a real estate developer and we are building, we own about 4,700 acres in unincorporated Pierce County. Um, and we'll be building there. We've been building for about eight years and we have about 13 more years to go. Uh, so eventually what we're building could end up being its own, own little city with uh, commercial and retail schools um, and obviously homes for all different types of family formations. So that's what I do in my, in, in my professional life. And uh, what really stood out to me in the information that we were provided is that 49% of people said that um, they, that we could use better exercise facilities, which is already a really high percentage, but 58% said that we have a need for better quality recreational facilities. So that really told me that not only do we obviously need the, the exercise piece of it, the pool and the, the gym, if, we, if that's the piece of it, um, but to really make sure that we're building in components for recreation outside of, of exercise um, for, I think Ed kind of spoke to that as well, places for families to gather and do classes and groups and meetings and, and things of that nature. And then of course, for me personally, hopefully some art um, shows and, and performances maybe even. Um, so that's what really stood out to me. And it's amazing to me that neither of you guys chose my, the first eye that popped into my head because when I realized I was the third eye, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to come up with three eyes in case they pick my first choices. I, the first thing that popped into my head was inspiration. Um, and so I hope that, uh, you know, and I actually have two eyes because I was trying to think of as many as I could. Um, I hope that our group can inspire people and as we illustrate uh, togetherness and cooperation. One of the other things that stood out to me was concern, several comments about concern that the two cities would have trouble working together and figuring out how to pay for it together and where is it going to be located and is that good for the citizen versus that citizen. And so I hope that we can be good citizen South King County stewards and really illustrate and inspire people by our togetherness and our cooperation to make this happen. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very much. All right. With uh, the letter T, we've got Laura. Hello, I am Laura Morrissey. I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission for the city of Covington. I've lived in Covington for 11 years. Um, I moved to Covington from Vienna, Austria. I lived there for five years with my family. Um, Austria has been voted the best, or Vienna has been voted the best city in the world to live in for the past eight years. And it's also one of the greenest cities in the world. And while living there, I discovered my passion for parks and for um, connectivity via footpath trails, sidewalks, etc. Um, when we moved back to the United States, we deliberately chose to live in Covington because we saw just so much potential for the many things that we loved in Vienna to be developed here. Uh, I have four children, ages 15, 14, 11, and 10. Um, I'm a runner in my spare time, what little spare time I have. And my word for T is trade-offs, because looking through all of the wishes and the wants and the desires from the two cities, I would love to be able to do all of that in whatever it is we're gonna build, but I'm pretty sure that we don't have the money for that. And so we're gonna to have to be realistic and we're going to probably have to make some trade-offs in our choosing. Um, so it's not really a warm fuzzy word, but I think it's important in all of this that we are realistic and not necessarily idealistic so that we end up with a product that works for both communities and is sustainable long term. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, that speaks directly to this practicality. <laughs> that's, a, that's a welcome addition. Thank you. All right. Uh, so what we've got with the letter Y is uh, Mark. Good evening. This is Mark Persley. I'm the director of the Greater Maple Valley Community Center. I've been there about eight years. Prior to that, I spent uh, 20 plus years with the Boys and Girls Clubs of King County. Um, personally, married three kids, two of which are special needs. One of the things that, that really jumped out at me from the surveys was the emphasis on the need for programs for families and kids, which is great. Didn't see a great deal about seniors or special needs populations, um, which surprised me a little bit. Uh, my letter is Y, and I appreciate that my letter is not X or Z. Um, but for Y, what I'll say is year round. 
And by that, I mean, it's important to have the indoor recreation. You've also got to have the outdoor facilities, but those outdoor fa facilities have to be all weather. Uh, you know, outdoor swimming pools are great, but they're only good for three months a year. Uh, so year round, make sure that, that uh, we can use them all, all the parts of it, 12 months a year. All right, excellent, Mark, thank you. With the letter S, we've got Jim. Yes, Jim here. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm in the car. I have some things I need to do tonight, and I was uh, brought in uh, fairly late to the party, but I am prepared. Uh, I've been a uh, Covington resident for over 20 years before we just moved out, out of the city limits here a few years ago. I was uh, a park uh, a planning commissioner for 11 years and a chair. 11 years as a city council member for the city of Covington. Um, 35 years as a financial advisor, helping people grow their wealth and retire early <laughs> is all our goals. I have five grandchildren, three of whom live here. Um, uh, the ones that live here are 13, 11, and six. They've all learned to swim at our aquatic center, which is the jewel of Covington in my eyes. Been married for 48 years to a wonderful woman. I'm an avid uh, swimmer. Uh, been uh, swimming competitively back in the day and golfer, and uh, I'm a men's club member at uh, the Maple Valley Golf Course, Lake Wilderness. So uh, the outdoor activities are important to me. I do them year round, I've got Gore-Tex. Um, one thing uh, that struck me, uh, and what was my letter again? Yes. Yes. Well, what I wrote down before you were, I was, you were giving me a letter is um, the value of this is Ken Two Cities actually partnership and make a result happen. So um, S, how about uh, a common solution that is actually uh, feasible that can actually work? Um, I know uh, we have some interlocal agreements between Black Diamond and Covington that have worked out great in Maple Valley. Uh, but this is a whole different uh, ball game when you're talking about the sums of money and uh, the infrastructure needed for a facility like this. I will say one thing that I read in the comments that I'd like to stress is that it, it should be close to a mall. And with that, I'll close. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, with the letter T, we've got Christina. My name is Christina, Christina Soltis. Um, I currently sit on the city council in Covington. Uh, my part-time day job is a sonographer. So for those who don't know, because most don't know, I actually hesitated there. I do ultrasound. I work with various people of all ages, primarily seniors, but I love, love, love what I do. And I just am too adamant and don't want to give it up at all. Um, and my letter is T. Before I go there though, I have a six-year-old and an 11 year old. And since we've even heard of this steering committee, I, <laughs> I have explored every option and heard from every person I could. And everyone I meet, I'm like, hey, what do you wanna see? What do you wanna see? What do you wanna see? But my real passion, honestly, and the future of this community, because truly by the time we're done, um, is teenagers. It's teenagers. I have five, I'm thrilled. Um, teenagers are my passion. Uh, I think teamwork, teamwork between the Tri-Cities. Um, I loved how our Black Diamond representative said, oh, just a neighbor. No. And I think, you know, teamwork is so, so important and inclusive in, as a part of this inclusivity. Um, there's going to be a huge transition. Transition is another one of my T's um, and trust. I, I value trust very much. Um, it comes from both the campaign trail and just in general, I do, I think it's so important to continue to have the trust of our citizens and, and, and not burn that at any, at any end, right? So we have to keep them included, have to include them in all the entire process. Um, but as I read through the comments, trust was one of my big ones. I, 
several citizens mentioned that you know they don't trust they don't trust so whatever we can do to get as many people involved um, in both surveys and the entire process we have a long we, we have we have a long road ahead of us but I was also surprised that the pool and the rock climbing wall were the two biggest things I actually went through and highlighted and underlined the two things so if if that was the biggest thing then we to keep the trust of of the community we should value that um, but in no way shape or form do I see this as a one-sided thing there are so many things and we're going to morph as a community and our teenagers are going to grow up and we have to continue to listen we have to continue to listen to what they want and give it to them um, I know parking is a huge deal, so we have to morph with that, whether it's underground, whether it's above ground. Um, but I am so thrilled and so excited to be part of the steering committee. And I think we are going to do great, great things together and more power to us. Excellent. Thank you. All right. With the letter U, we have Jeff. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Wagner. I moved to Covington back in 88 and had a local craft store, Wagner's Crafts. And one of the things that uh, I've been involved in is all about kids. Even when I was single and had our store, it was trying to find avenues for kids and their parents to find a way to have recreation in the area before we were cities, before we were Covington, before we were Maple Valley. And we looked, there was a group of us that looked for trying to build a community center back at that time in many different locations and it just never panned out. I have been involved with many different organizations. I'm currently the president of the community and schools of Kent, helping kids to succeed in school. I've been on the Covington City Council since 2004. Um, like Linda, she started in 04, and I am currently on my 17th year, and I'm currently the mayor of Covington as well. And looking at all these results, looking at everything that our um, results look at, I mean, teen center, dance rooms, multi-purpose rooms, indoor pools, gymnasium, I've always wanted to see something similar to a YMCA out in the Covington Maple Valley area or Black Diamond, but one that's like in Pierce County where it's even bigger than what we see here in King County. So, you know, just making it a community resource center for seniors, for teens, for youth, for adults, where they can go to get all the recreation needs that they're looking for, even meeting rooms for chambers and organizations, having a craft store. I mean, it'd be great to have a community room where you can do quilting. And yes, I've done quilting and uh, I enjoy doing that. My letter is you, so I have two words for that, unique and ultimate. And I would like to see the ultimate unique facility in Southeast King County that all of our residents can be proud and can use in one location without having to go all over South King County to get what they need for their families. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, since uh, Matthew stole the letter D, uh, Allison, that leaves you with the letter Y. Okay, I was already for the D. Okay, um, do you mind if I do D again? Because I have a good. That's I, fine. I, Absolutely. Okay. All right. I was even like, I, I, I had Y as a backup just in case. But okay. Hi, I'm Allison Warner. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you throughout these uh, meetings. Um, and good evening to Maple Valley and Covington residents who are watching this. Um, I uh, am a resident of Maple Valley. We've been here for 10 years, my family and I. Prior to that, we lived in Kent for eight years. My husband is born and raised in Kent. We are very familiar with these communities. Um, my day job full time is I'm the director for career and advising at Green River College. So my lens is always education. I've had the pleasure of advising many of the community members uh, throughout their 
journey of pursuing their academic and career goals and um, so looking at this, I'm also looking at this from a lens of not only recreational needs, but educational and uh, community space as well. Uh, both of my kids uh, are in middle school and very active um, in athletics. Uh, my, both my kids learned to swim at Covington. My daughter has been part of a, a year-round swim team for three years. We're members of the Kent Swim and Tennis Club, so the aquatic world is part of our daily lives. Um, I have enjoyed many a morning workouts at Covington as part of the Raise the Bar uh, training. So it's been uh, part of our lives and we're looking forward to uh, watching this, um, uh, this idea grow, hopefully into something that um, is, um, becomes a reality. Let's see, so my, well, before I get to my letter, one of the things I definitely saw in all of the survey results was more commonality between what people's needs and wants are. I saw a lot of themes that popped up that um, people are concerned about the same things between the two communities. They're concerned about location. They're concerned about access. They're concerned about parking, but they're also concerned about making sure that the diverse needs are being met between the, uh, the different communities that this is intending to serve. So my word is D diversity, not just uh, making sure that the diversity of voices are being heard on this committee and the steering group, but also that the diversity of um, needs within our community, um, including accessibility, are also being accounted for. So. All right, excellent. And Matthew, can you give us a D and a Y? So yeah. thank you, Reston. Reston, I thought that was just tremendous. And we're going to leave the uh, why for the best idea that comes. So that's the challenge for the rest of the steering committee members to think of the why and keep them engaged as we talk about what we're trying to accomplish. I think uh, we can move into the scope and the timeline and they can process what why comes to mind. You bet. Well, this um, item two on the agenda, and we'll, uh, we'll make up some time here because we went a little long, but it was totally worth it to listen to everyone. Thank you for all your your heartfelt uh, and really important feedback. That's great. Uh, scope of work. Um, we uh, are in the midst of a, a pretty extensive uh, number of tasks. And uh, some of this work has been done uh, already to date. We're gonna get into that here in just a moment. Uh, but basically there's a, a huge component of public outreach, um, which is underway and is gonna continue uh, underway in terms of collecting information and again being very very inclusive um, in any way we can think of we're using multiple platforms different media uh, public uh, processes like this town hall uh, virtual meetings that are coming up uh, anything we can think of uh, to uh, really invite meaningful uh, feedback that we'll absolutely take into consideration as we study the feasibility of, of, of indoor rec center. Site analysis, uh, again, underway. We're gonna talk about site uh, at the end of this meeting, so I won't drill into that much. Um, there's a lot of work uh, in the programming phase, which is gonna be the next uh, subject, primarily of the next uh, steering committee meeting that we have. So we'll talk about that also just at the end of this, uh, just touch on where we are and what's left in that process. From there, we're gonna be doing business planning, uh, cost modeling, some conceptual work once we've identified uh, what those best sites might be for something. Uh, but that something is we don't know yet because uh, it's not been studied and, and fully vetted with this group yet. Uh, but once we do that, we got to put some meat on the bones and stick a stake in the ground so we have something to then react to and, and study. And again, test the feasibility, as was very wisely uh, noted earlier in your, your uh, different descriptions of things is that's one of the keys of feasibility is it, the answer may be no. Uh, we're not trying to create a project. We're trying to see what might be feasible. And uh, that's a critical component of this. Uh, once we do that, we were gonna be uh, drilling more into uh, economic development analysis and funding. Uh, once we have an idea of what we're looking at in terms of magnitude of project uh, and, and some notion of the costs, we'll be also looking at cost feasibility and what, uh, what are some different ways of funding something of the magnitude that appears to be uh, defined in the program uh, based on all the community input that we get. So, and that's usually the one that's in the, at the end that says, yeah, it's feasible, or maybe maybe it isn't. So, um, that's, uh, again, all going to be summarized in a final report. So I'm feeding it with a fire hose, but that's the, the basically the, the short version of what our, our scope of work is. Um, 
I'm gonna go ahead and move into our um, steering committee charter. I'll just be brief on this. Um, Drew, if you can pull that document up. Um, wanted to talk about the mission statement for just a moment and make sure that that's clear and see if there's any feedback on this. The mission of the Covington Maple Valley Aquatics Recreation Center steering committee is to ensure that the feasibility study recommendations are based on a thorough, inclusive process that reflects the true needs of the citizens of the region. And I think all of you have very eloquently supported that through your observations of the findings so far and what you bring personally to this. Uh, really critical that it reflects your area and your need. And that's one of the beauties of us coming in from out of town. We, we don't have a, a dog in this fight, so to speak. Uh, we are here with a pretty blank slate and learning very, very rapidly about you and your citizens and, and what those needs are. And uh, we'll bring a very unbiased read on all of that for you to react to and hold that piece of this. Uh, I would also remind you in the, in the charter on that last page, uh, there is a section there uh, where we've requested that you uh, sign and return that to Matthew. And I know most of you have done that. If you uh, are, are one of the couple that hasn't yet, please do so. Uh, so we can check that box and say, yep, we are uh, completely good to go here. So, all right, with that, um, I am gonna turn it over at this point to uh, Dave Johnson and uh, Ethan Newton uh, to talk about the core planning group. So Dave, Ethan, it's all yours. Uh, Ethan, I'll let you start. Fair enough. Uh, I'm Ethan Newton. I'm the Parks Director for the City of Covington. Um, and, and very pleased to be here tonight, uh, even if it is virtually. It's nice to, to meet everybody and, and see some faces to the names. Uh, and I'm here to support the project in any way I can. Um, I do want to introduce um, the core planning group members that we have from Covington. Some of them may be on the meeting tonight, we have Jenna Estep, uh, who is the City of Covington's Community Development Director. She brings um, community planning and land use expertise, uh, as well as a background in parks and recreation. Uh, we have Rachel Drury. She's the Aquatics Manager at the Covington Aquatic Center. She brings aquatic facility operations expertise, as well as uh, a local history and perspective on indoor aquatic and recreation programs right here in Covington and Maple Valley. Uh, and then we also have Matt Keo, who's uh, you've all met and know, uh, and he's the main liaison with all of you, uh, serves as the project manager for the feasibility study, uh, and also is the main liaison with ALSC. He's kind of the glue that keeps us all together and the project moving forward along with, along with ALSC. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. I'll say it's just been a very positive experience working with this core planning group uh, from both Covington as well as the Maple Valley staff uh, and the ALSC team. Um, and it's great just to see us hit this milestone of getting the steering committee launched. So very uh, interested in hearing everybody's input. And I'll uh, kick it to you, Dave. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Dave Johnson. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director and Assistant City Manager for the City of Maple Valley. Uh, I'm, I've been excited for this uh, process to get to where we're at now. And after hearing everybody uh, introduce themselves and, and get to hear some of the background, uh, I'm even more excited now just with the, the balance of critical thinkers and creative minds and the passion and uh, the big picture that I think uh, everybody seems to be bringing uh, is exciting uh, to see. Uh, a little bit of background for me, just real briefly. Uh, I've been in the field of parks and recreation for 30 years. Uh, I've lived in Maple Valley since 1999. Uh, I've uh, helped design and open new recreation facilities. So uh, hopefully I've got a little bit of expertise or experience to lend, but really uh, looking to get some input from the steering committee. Um, Behind me, or, or actually with me, is is a, a, a team from the City of Maple Valley, and uh, I know at least one of them is on the call tonight, and that's Tim Morgan, our Economic Development Manager. Tim brings a lot of experience in the economic development world and, and business side of things, and Sarah Brendan is our Communications Specialist, uh, so helps support Covington in 
getting the word out, social media, press releases, and, and all things communications related. So that's, uh, that's our team. Um, we're pleased to be working with the city of Covington and we're uh, happy to see some friends from Black Diamond here on this steering committee as well. So uh, looking forward to, to seeing where this process takes us. Thank you. Excellent, Ethan, Dave, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move to our project schedule. So Drew, if you could pull that up. Um, we don't need to probably spend a full 10 minutes on this to make up a little bit of time. Uh, just wanted to walk you through the, the overall schedule. Uh, this is, by the way, posted on the uh, uh, Recreate Recreate website, uh, just so everyone can see. Um, you can see that this, uh, actually there's a, a several other columns we could have included to the left because we actually started working back in March and April, uh, but we really uh, needed to kind of figure out where COVID was taking this and ultimately decided, let's just go virtual with everything since we can't gather. And so we kicked this off again with this, uh, beginning with this meeting. Um, for the, uh, the steering committee. You can kind of see the, the progress to date with the telephone survey, the online survey, which is ongoing, uh, the public feedback process, which is gonna go all the way out into January. Uh, we wanna leave that window as wide open as we can for as long as we can, but at some point we need to say, okay, we've gathered a bunch. Uh, that, this is what this is starting to look like and uh, start landing it as a, a project so we can wrap costs and other uh, processes around that. Uh, you'll see progress uh, reports that are going to be um, posted right after these meetings, uh, just for, for uh, again, to the website, keeping everyone as informed in real time as, as we can. Down below, uh, the public participation is more the some of the back behind the scenes work that's been done and is being done. If you could scroll down a little bit, Drew. Um, the research and input, we're gonna go over that here in just a moment on the work that's been performed to date. Uh, there's a lot of analysis has gone on, a lot of work already done on uh, potential sites out there. We're gonna drill into those specific sites and that analysis more next meeting. This meeting, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna figure out which of those sites uh, becomes more favorable. Uh, from there, it, we really are gonna be drilling in uh, very heavily in the next month into programming. And architecturally and from a feasibility st standpoint, programming means what is the scope of the project? What needs to be included in it? based on numerous factors uh, from uh, certainly starting with input from the community, uh, input from the steering committee, a core planning group, uh, input from the consultant team. Uh, the reason you, you bring in someone that's done a lot of these is we bring a lot of lessons learned from other uh, facilities. Uh, we're not gonna use that to drive this, we're gonna use that to inform and, and, and improve uh, on what the result of this is going to be based on, on those other projects. Uh, so that, a lot of that's gonna be happening in the next month. Uh, and a lot of it's already done. When we do a, a, a statistically valid survey, which uh, uh, Michael's gonna get into here in a minute, that gives us a lot of really good information in a sh very short amount of time. From there, as, gonna, as I mentioned, um, we're gonna take that information and start landing it on a site uh, or sites, depending on what the outcomes are, uh, as, a, as a project, as a building. So we can start putting costs to it and start understanding the, the signature of this, what that's starting to look and feel like What's it gonna cost? And then right into the impacts of that, how would you fund it? What are those options? And ultimately, is it is it feasible? Uh, that's a real quick feed you with a fire hose version of the schedule, but uh, that's where we are in that. And we're gonna get right now into uh, some of the work that's already been performed to date. Um, we'll go ahead and leave this slide up for just a minute. I'll kick this off and then I'm gonna have Michael talk a little bit more about the, the uh, outreach. And, and the things that are currently underway and work that we've already done. So what we have started with is uh, basically a situational assessment uh, with Matthew and, and Drew really drilling into what might, what might be out there that's not necessarily obvious. We've made lots and lots of phone calls. A lot of you have been involved in that process, um, trying to really understand what's, what's the big picture? What are those uh, really critical issues uh, that this project needs to address directly? Um, we've also performed that, that statistically valid phone survey, which gave, gives us really good information and starts putting a little bit of, of a, a structure together on what this might start to look and feel like. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work on the website, a lot of public outreach uh, in, in terms of uh, social media. We'll continue to do that, and Michael will talk more about that. 
And in fact, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Michael uh, to talk just a bit about the, the public outreach and some of the survey work that's been done. So Michael, can you take it away? Sure thing. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, my name is Michael Dean. Uh, I'm an account director with Desitel Hagee. Uh, we work with ALS, ALSC quite a bit um, and had the pleasure of kind of getting involved in this project. Um, so what we have kind of laid out um, in terms of public outreach, um, we have a kind of a calendar going for when uh, we're promoting different things. And so um, we promoted tonight uh, via Facebook and, uh, and events and that type of things. We, we've identified all the channels and uh, sorts of things that we're using uh, for the last for the last couple of weeks and then in the next several months. Um, so uh, what that'll look like moving forward um, will be some uh, you know uh, promoted social media posts and uh, to drum up some attendance for the town halls um, later in the project schedule. That's where we'll um, spend, try to get a lot of public input and attendance on those town halls. Um, and then we're also utilizing kind of the, uh, the email list and newsletters that both cities have available to them. Um, that includes the websites and uh, press releases and those types of things. So um, I'll kind of walk through one of the biggest things that we've done so far in terms of public input has been this survey, uh, this 200 person phone survey uh, that was conducted in uh, late August, early September. Uh, I believe you guys were sent this beforehand, but um, I don't want to take up a ton of time, but I'll walk you through it. Um, I know I some of you mentioned that you, you've seen it already, but I'll walk you through it. Um, this is the executive summary, and then I'll just kind of touch on a couple of the data points going throughout. So uh, in late August and early September, the telephone survey was conducted among uh, 200 residents uh, in kind of a potential future service area of this project. Uh, the kind of the key findings that we found were uh, currently people are most likely to use the Covington Aquatic Center or their own homes uh, for indoor recreation. When uh, we asked them where they go for current needs or what are the factors that go into their decisions for where they go for current needs, uh, safety was, was number one, convenience was number two, uh, staff instructor knowledge and friendliness was number three, and cost was number four. And then um, 52 percent of the people we talked to uh, drove less than 20 minutes for uh, indoor recreation activities and uh, the the cool thing that we can do with that survey is kind of compare uh, Covington and Maple Valley so one thing that we saw different here was Covington residents are likely to drive a little bit further currently uh, than Maple Valley residents is, is what the data showed um, the survey didn't have any strong negative feelings towards current options in the area, but 58% of residents did indicate uh, they saw a need for better quality facilities in their community, recreation facilities. Um, and then that's when we started getting into uh, the programming Rustin was talking about. We went through a list of, I believe it was 15 or, or 20 uh, different types of uh, programming that you could do. Uh, pools and recre recreation swimming was at the top of the list and swim lessons were very important as well. Um, competitive and lap swimming were, uh, they were ranked the lower on the lower end of those, uh, those questions. And keep going through, there was one more page I believe Drew of that. Yeah, there we go. So um, we asked also about future use, or we asked how often they use the current one. 53 uh, said that they would new, use a new aquatic facility once a month or more. Um, and 20% of residents were, weren't sure if they would use it or not. Um, Maple Valley residents were more likely to indicate that they would never use a new facility than Coverington residents. Um, over a third of the respondents, even though we said that they, they said that they do, most people do use the Covington Aquatic Center in the past, over a third said they haven't used it in the past year. And Maple Valley residents were more likely to not use the Covington Aquatic Center, which makes sense. Um, and then uh, people believe that it, it has uh, adequate recreation for their community now, but fewer in Maple Valley feel this way. More than one in three don't know enough. They don't really have an opinion on the matter at all. Um, both communities did believe that the new facility would serve their community well. Um, when we asked about kind of how willing would you be 
to pay a little bit more on taxes for a new facility, the majority of Maple Valley residents indicated they would not feel comfortable doing that. Um, and then uh, really getting down to the, the nitty gritty of the feature, 78% believed an indoor pool is important. Uh, following that, an outdoor pool, gymnasium, and indoor walking jock track was, was also ranked highly. So Drew, maybe we go to just those. I think those are kind of important. Uh, so maybe that next sl slide seven on here. I'm sorry, not slide seven. It's slide. Uh, it's it's question seven. It's slide fourteen. So this is the uh, this is a scale of one to seven of what's important and, and, and what's not. So these scores, these five point nine, that's kind of on a, a scale of seven. So recreational swimming got a, a score of five point nine out of seven. Uh, learn to swim and swimming lessons got a score of 5.8. Uh, spa, whirlpool, tub, 5.6. You can kind of see how we go. Um, you know, nothing was like in the ones or twos. Uh, so everything was kind of a, th a, you know, a three, three and a half and above. Uh, but uh, that's kind of how things kind of sorted out from this survey. And there was a pretty even distribution um, between the two communities as well. And then I drew the very last slide, uh, 25, I think is also one, another kind of a similar one. So when we talk specifically about uh, different features in the, the center, uh, same, same deal, one to seven is a scale here. So an indoor pool uh, ranked a 6.14 overall, outdoor pool ranked a 5.59, and you can see down the list there, um, gymnasium, indoor walk track. Uh, we did ask, we, we left these open-ended and, uh, you know, if there wasn't a feature that uh, we asked about the next slide, it, we didn't have a lot on there. Uh, the things that did got brought up were a climbing wall and uh, a racquetball and those types of things. So I know I don't, I don't, I don't want to take up a ton of time on here, Rustin, but uh, any questions on, I know you guys had this before as well. So any questions on the, the phone survey that I can answer for you? You know, one thing, uh, Michael, if you wouldn't mind, would you discuss the, the, the accuracy and the, the uh, statistically valid uh, uh, yep. component of this? Yeah, so this was, um, this is a statistically valid survey. It's a random sample. Um, it's a plus minus 7% at the confidence level. So um, when you look at kind of the difference between the two communities, you'll need to have a seven point difference in order to really mark that as something that's like, you know, real and valid and actionable. I saw somebody raise their hand on the panelist section. Chris, I believe. Yeah, that was me. Uh, this might not be super relevant, but when <clears throat> when you look at the results and it talks all about the aquatic use and then we asked about other things, do you feel that the fact that this was labeled as an aquatic project skews those other things? I guess what I'm saying is if it was a more general survey that didn't say it was about an aquatic center, do you feel those results would have been different about what people were asking for? You'd get more turf fields, you'd get more other responses, or do you think that's not relevant really in what we're talking about? You know, we tried to keep the script that the, these were phone surveys and the script that they went off of, you know, obviously through some of the answers that we're asking about, you know, pools and those types of things, the, the respondent would get the idea that it's for an aquatic center, but we tried really to be unbiased on you know what specifically this was for until the until uh, you know they got through the survey, um, there there might be a little bit of bias in that just due to the nature of the things we were asking about. But we really tried to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Al Allison has her hand raised too, I believe. Yeah, just a quick comment uh, uh, to note that the survey, of course, was done in uh, late summer, early August during. This time when a lot of the uh, services and um, activities are not available. So some of the questions we're asking about, you know, when's the last time you utilized the Covington Aquatic Center? Of course, that was probably skewed because it's been closed. Sure. Well, and of course, it's open, but very limited. So just something to make note of in this.
Very fair. Then Les, I believe you had one. Yeah, I was just going to mention that uh, we've done several surveys in Maple Valley uh, over the years, and uh, our first uh, concern for citizens from citizens was was ball fields, which we've recently added some. But uh, number two on that list has constantly been uh, indoor recreation facilities, and and so uh, that's something that we've seen consistent through the last decade. Great. Right, excellent. And I think there, there was one uh, question from the, the public here from Jonathan Ingram um, asking if the uh, estimated costs of replacement have been shared with attendees yet. Uh, we did not ask that in the phones or we did not have that in the phone survey. Um, so that was not a, uh, they were not given that information. All right, uh, let's go ahead and keep moving it. Drew, would you touch uh, on the situational assessment and the, the summary comments from that? All right, so we um, also have been through the website of Recreate, Re uh, Recreate, we had basically been reaching out to members of the community that um, we knew about, some of you I've talked to, and then additionally, um, the general public was able to answer those same questions via the online survey. We had um, over 120 responses as of the printing of this. The, the survey is still live through the website or should be. And then through that, and I know everyone's reviewed this, so I don't want to go running through each one of the items, but just to kind of quickly show you the formatting, we had the question and then all of the responses that we received. These are unedited, so um, how it was input into the system is kind of what ended up here with spelling errors and all sorts of other formatting issues. So um, this is a unedited, undoctored response from people in the community. So as you can see, there's plenty of responses. And then if I just jump to the end, we kind of went through and put the key findings of those um, items. And I actually don't know if I'm, hopefully I'm sharing my correct screen there for you. Um, the Answers had a lot of overlap, but for question one, it was talking about the limited access to indoor recreation, um, sports and non-sports interests being represented. So a um, whole bunch of different pieces in here. And then we also had um, in question two, there's again questions or findings of being, making the space inclusive of different users, their ability levels, affordability, making sure it was family focused, that was a big one. Um, and then also transportation and making sure that there was options for multimodal, which is pedestrian, cycling, um, public transit, cars, the whole gamut. So making sure that that piece was covered. Um, we also got into um, different means of advertising on here. So this is stuff that we wouldn't ask in the statistically valid survey. So there was some informational stuff that we were trying to get out of the community and users here, whether it's Facebook or billboards. Then uh, for question three, um, again, the lack of access to indoor recreation facilities came up. Um, having different offerings available, what um, might be items that are draws to the facility. Um, and item four, question four, the findings have a lot of overlap. And some of that might just be because of it being fresh in their mind. But um, these are some of the activities that we saw repeated multiple times and kind of just listed those out. And then um, when we jump to question four, we get a lot of the exact same things. Um, we had some talk about tracks, wave pools, splash pads. 
So these were items to help draw people from neighboring communities into this as a destination venue, essentially. Um, and then question five, we ended up, how do we bring the two communities together? There were some comments about this earlier tonight, um, making sure that people feel that wherever the facility lands, and this will be a key part of tonight's um, site criteria weighting, is making sure that both cities have equitable services provided to them, and that the site and future growth are considered um, for the not just the growth of the site, but also the growth of the cities and making sure that that's understood and considered in this feasibility study. Um, along with traffic and infrastructure impacts to the two cities and where this would end up going. And then educating people on taxation was another one that got brought up. Um, that also again came up with the taxation in number six's question with taxation and funding sources methods um, also kind of came up in this was access for the different communities and traveling costs and methods of accessing it. Um, and then there were some comments about tying it to nature, um, having a long term plan of view for the facility. And then again, question seven had some of the exact same things with transportation and location funding sources. I guess my question or question to the steering committee members is if you had any of those key findings that you either didn't view were the same or if you saw other ones that we didn't list in our key findings from all of those responses. And if you have a comment that you'd like to add, if you want to raise your hand or send it through the question and answer, we can address those. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye open for those and we can circle back as, as needed. We'll, we'll keep going here. The next piece of this, we've got Scott Karen on the call here from uh, Ballard King. Ballard King is uh, all about market analysis, uh, business planning and They've already been at work uh, helping to start identify what a market area for a project such as this would look like. Uh, and I'm gonna have Scott kind of go through all the different filters and considerations uh, that have allowed us to identify an area enough that we can do our phone surveys and, and make sure we're getting the coverage that we need. So Scott, take it away. Sure, and uh, again, I uh, appreciate being here tonight and Ken apologizes for uh, not being able to, to be with you. Ken Ballard is the principal with Ballard King and he's been the, the one working on a lot of this. I've been doing all the background work, so I'm um, intimately familiar with uh, all of these maps and, and everything. And so, as you can see from what is on the screen, uh, one of the first things when we look at doing a feasibility study, study and a market analysis is determining what the service areas for that project is gonna be. And so the, the first one uh, that we took a look at um, obviously is the, the primary service area, which would be Covington and, and Maple Valley. And so uh, the, the green areas that are kind of hidden in the background there uh, are those two community uh, communities combined. And so then we take a look at Okay, so we know what that primary service area is. What, what's our secondary market? Because when you take a look at, um, when, you, when you take a look at it, we know that people are going to come from outside uh, of that area. But how far are they going to come from, and uh, what does that market look like? What are the what are the demographics and, and everything within that? And so that's where we try to take a look at what the the options may be. And so we looked at uh, the the zip codes that were represented. Uh, of the Covington and, and Maple Valley areas. And then we also took a look at, all right, uh, if we just kind of drew a, a, a hand-drawn area uh, of, of the surrounding communities, what, what would that look like? Um, and then uh, finally, what we did is we dropped a pin right in the smack dab middle of uh, both of those two communities and did a 15 minute drive time. And what that, what would that look like? And so those are the, the, uh, secondary service areas, if you will, uh, that we have identified as the options uh, to, to move forward. And I guess one of the things that 
uh, we're looking for for feedback from uh, everybody tonight is what do we feel is is the most appropriate uh, secondary service area uh, when we when we take a look at just in general the 15 minute drive time as well as that that yellow area are pretty similar uh, as far as uh, total population size um, so the the main difference uh, is that the zip codes uh, probably are not going to reach uh, as many people as what we feel it would be most appropriate so um, that's what the so looking back and forth so that's the the yellow area and that is the hand drawn and then the 15 minute drive time uh, is the that red area again you can kind of see the the lake there that it's a little bit harder for people to to get around to um, so and if you know I, I know we had talked uh, previously if that you know again we, we just dropped a pin right in the middle um, so if we do determine a site we can uh, again draw it to get uh, a better a better handle on exactly where that site would be and what the drive times are uh, from and to that site. All right thank you very much what I'd like to do is circle back we've got uh, some questions that have come up so Drew if you can uh, go back and, and pull those up let's uh, get, yeah. get some dialogue and some answers going. So Allison had submitted a question uh, or raised her hand so we'll start with Allison just because she's up above uh, Marriott and uh, then we'll go down through. All right, just a quick question regarding the survey. I can't remember, was there like biodemographic information that was pulled on who answered the questions? So we know whose voices we're hearing in these in these answers, in these, in these uh, submissions. Are you speaking to the situational assessment or to the phone survey? The situational assessment. No, there was no um, data or demographics pulled from the individuals. It was completely anonymous. That's why it's not a statistical valid survey. Yeah, okay. Is there plans to do that again and to maybe pull in to see who we're hitting in these surveys and maybe who we need to uh, target somebody's questions to in the, for, for future? Um, we haven't discussed that, so. Okay, okay. The, to clarify, the, the phone survey did have age in, uh, it, it had a, uh, yeah, it had age, gender, uh, length of residence, children, homeowner, runner. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, Marietta. Marietta, probably. Or Maria, yeah. sorry. Okay, I just want to make sure it was me. Um, uh, my question is about the situational survey. Also, is because like an example is the rock wall was mentioned many times. Do we have any feel for? whether different people mentioned Rockwall or if it was one Rockwall enthusiast that kept mentioning it. And that, I saw that happen on different topics. I'm just using the Rockwall as, as a, an example. Yeah, so I guess if they wanted to, they could have gone through and done the survey multiple times. Uh, we didn't track for that. It's literally, they would have had to complete the survey multiple times. So we were literally just going off of the number of times it was mentioned in here and taking that raw data, so. But each each person that took it answered each of the questions, right? Yep. So it's possible that one person could have been so excited about a rock wall, they, they put it in multiple answers. They would have had to complete multiple surveys, yes. <laughs> might uh, add, Drew, I might just add to Marita's question. Um, somebody could have written Rockwall in multiple answers in their one survey. Uh, they really would have been challenged to take the survey more than once because we had a control on that. So at least we did not have people being able to take the survey multiple times. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Rosie, I see you have a question as well. Yeah, um, also in the situational survey, just one thing that I saw repeated and I've just noticed in general in our community is the focus on a need for a teen space particularly. And I know that you have in key findings um, words like family focus and multi-generational, but I didn't see a call out for teens. And I'm just wanting to make sure that that gets out there that um, that should be a focus separately in addition to children and family and multi-generational, but I think 
seniors and teens maybe need to be specifically called out. Okay. Yep, good point. I think we were just lumping that in the multi-generational, um, so. Um, and then last, I think you have a question as well. Yeah, two questions uh, regarding the service area. First of all, uh, curious what the population was in the likely service area that's in yellow or in red. And then secondly, um, do we have an overlay for legislative districts? Uh, just, see, you know, seeing what that might look like and the support that we might be able to garner for potential grants. Uh, so the 15 minute drive time uh, estimated population is just under 200,000. And then the yellow one is about 200 and just under 220,000 uh, in total population. So uh, again, pretty similar in size, probably they're going to be a little bit different demographically, but just total population uh, uh, wise, they're, they're fairly similar. We can, uh, if we can pull up a, uh, the con congressional districts, we could certainly take a look that, at that as well um, and send that out to, to everybody as to what, uh, what that would look like. So we can, we can just do uh, some rough baseline type things and uh, we'll get together with, with Rustin and, and, and how we want to put that out to everybody. Yep. Thanks. And, and just to, to add to that, it's a great question. Uh, there's going to be much more work done on that a little bit later in the process by uh, Campbell and Company. They are our, uh, our, our funding experts on the team. And as soon as we get a little bit further along, they'll be looking at uh, the, the districts, uh, the potential for uh, you know, special tax districts, all, all those types of uh, uh, you know, potentials on, on uh, how to maybe fund this. But that comes just a little bit later. And then we have one more hand up currently, Christina. And if you've already had your question answered, if you can unraise your hand, um, that'd be great. Unless you have an, another question, then keep it up. So Christina, if you wanna take it away. I think that begins to answer several questions for many people. Um, but as I read through the situational survey, it was interesting to me um, that I feel like it's it was programmed in an essay type of format. And I do know that we have so many wise people on the team that maybe could, if, if this is even an option, could format the survey to create its own program and create whether it's percentages because um, like uh, Marita and Allison, I believe, uh, mentioned, there were many people who, most people mentioned the pool and a rock wall. And those are both amazing things. I am surprised that nobody did mention a bowling ring. Um, in my experience, both in the medical field and just working with people, I feel like that is one of those things that actually addresses, for, you know, from the really young ages to the to the, the really uh, far into your decades, uh, people love bowling. Um, but if that would be an option, to just maybe uh, format it to where it categorizes what people want, or maybe only give them options that they can categorize. I don't know, but just so there was so much repetition um, that. I went back and just underlined a few pages, but again, I'm not a program, and they really stood out to me. Um, just food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, I think, two more questions. Jim. Yes, I'm unmuted. I see. I think, yeah, I am. Okay. Um, is there any way to uh, separate the surveys from the the phone ones from the other ones. That might give us sort of a thread of how they how how people answered them. They are separate, um, so they were sent as two separate documents. So the phone survey results. This uh, document here. I'll just go back to the front page. So that's that just is, the phone. 
This is just the phone. Okay. All right. So that, that then, answers that question. Yep. And then the situational survey is its separate item. Um, and some of that formatting is left that way. So as we get more results, we could populate those into it. So very good. Okay. So we at least have that. Um, yep. My other concern is uh, the name. Um, you know, I went online on all the different community centers that were recommended for us to view. And they all say community centers because there's a lot of activities that are there, not just recreation. Um, and the bowling, I did see a couple bowling, <laughs> which all got me excited because bowling is a great indoor sport. Um, but I think uh, a community center, I'm not sure that that's the right name for it either. So I think we need to spend some time on our vision here on what we're going to name this thing to, to get everybody behind it. Not just the people that want to swim, not just the people that want to rock wall, but how about those people who want to dance and want to go to a, a play? I know uh, Black Diamond, they have that capacity with their indoor gym. Uh, they can do multitude of things in that gym where uh, if we just have a facility that it's just, you know, recreation and not looking at those other aspects of the community, um, I think we're going to lose some people. That's all I had. Excellent. Thank you. Then, Allison, do you have another question? <laughs> I do. Sorry. Oh, and I'm no, just going to... I just want to make sure that I wasn't calling yeah. you out again. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I raise it again. <laughs> just to go back to making sure that we are hearing the collective voices as, as much as possible of Covington and Maple Valley. If I, I would encourage us to think about resending out another survey and maybe identifying it uh, different languages that it can be translated in. So we can really understand what our community needs are. We have a pretty diverse community in Covington, multiple language speakers. English is not always their first language. So I would encourage us to look at that. Um, and then also to ask and to, and to look at the biodemographic information uh, of, the, of the submissions. So to make sure that we are capturing a wide breadth of feedback. It could just be we're, we're capturing the you know, 25 to 50 year old, you know, um, uh, families, right? Uh, and, we, and we're not hearing from our seniors or from our youth, so. Great, thank you, Allison. Uh, we have Moni actually with her, uh, with a question right now. Just a comment, um, Allison, you took what I was trying to say was with diversity, like I feel like maybe we can send the survey back with getting more demographics on just of our, of our population. I mean, who are we targeting here? Um, how are we targeting us? And like you said, maybe having different ways of doing the survey. I mean, I don't know, like sending a paper survey out, not everybody's computer savvy and what have you or different languages. So I would definitely say more towards diversity. Just to capture everybody. Great. Thanks, Molly. Um, I think that's it. Um, Allison, you want to unraise your hand? I, I'm taking it you didn't, you don't have another question. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, Preston, I think we're ready to keep moving on. Sure, we got one last piece here. Uh, we're within a, a few minutes of our, our pacing here on this meeting. So thanks for uh, helping us kind of accelerate through some of this. Uh, the last piece we have, we really wanna, uh, if we can go back to the uh, agenda for just a moment, uh, Drew. As we're doing our programming, I, I'm giving you just a little bit of a look ahead uh, on one of the components of how we do our programming and ultimately our business planning looking at revenue generation potential, looking at operational cost uh, impacts, because ultimately it, it becomes a question of, of subsidy at, at some point. How, how can the facility pay for itself? Um, most of them don't. Uh, most of them do end up with some level of a subsidy. And as we're looking at programming, uh, I'm just, again, giving you a, a little bit of a heads up on, a, on one of the tools that we use I just want to plant the seed tonight. We don't really need to drill into it yet. We're going to drill into it next next month. But it has to do with um, what Ballard King typically does with these types of surveys. As soon as we start getting more into programming, taking all of this survey input and starting to, to propose different ways of, of facilitating all of these programs through space types and space sizes, 
know, gymnasiums and multi-purpose rooms and, and all the things we've been talking about tonight. Um, Ballard King brings to that conversation per space, what that type of space might generate for revenue and what that type of space costs to operate. And what you start to see in that, and Drew, maybe you can pull up that, um, that matrix uh, from Ballard King. What that starts to suggest is we need to, in that programming conversation next time, look at priorities. Because ultimately some of the things that you're really gonna be looking at that uh, you may feel as a high priority is actually gonna be a very high cost to operate and very low, low on the revenue side, which is gonna translate into a, a, a tougher business model, um, which starts to maybe challenge your feasibility. And I'm not trying to steer at all. I'm just explaining this is one of those filters that we're gonna be looking at and the experience that the team brings to this type of a conversation. What you see on your screen there, we've got some space types that are high revenue potential, medium revenue potential and low revenue potential. That doesn't mean one's more popular than the other. This is just a very practical look at what those things are. And we'll bring more detail to this conversation uh, next time. But again, just wanted to plant the seed with you. This is one of those things to be thinking about. Uh, and we'll give you more detail and, and prepare you for that next conversation uh, regarding programming. But yeah, leisure pools are always number one. Why? Because they are popular. Uh, when that leisure pool is in operation, it will be full of people. Uh, it, it's You can almost walk across the pool and not get wet um, just because of all the people there. Typically a, a, a lap pool, not so much. Uh, you can see on the low revenue potential side, you see a competitive 50 meter pool. That's because they don't hold as many people. Uh, you can do carousel swimming and still have a lot of people in there, but it just doesn't generate the revenue because it just doesn't hold the, the, the number of bodies. So again, I'm just putting that out there for now um, to, for you all to, to think about and consider um, mostly for the next time. Uh, but it's, it's one I just wanna make sure you can get your head, head wrapped around there. So with that, we're uh, at our break time. So we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break for you to stretch your legs, uh, gather some thoughts. Um, we'll open it up uh, when we re regather here with any other questions you might have on what we've covered so far. And then we'll get into our site analysis criteria. So Matthew, I'm gonna take it back to you, but we're gonna, we're gonna take a five minute break. Sure. Well, five minutes looks to me like around, uh, well, I'll be certainly back by 740. 740. Great. Thanks, everybody. We are just about at 740. It looks like we have a good number of you back already. So fantastic for that. And um, remember the challenge at hand, we needed to come up with a letter Y value or outcome. So we have a minute here. If anybody's got one, they want to float, and all are all are correct. There's no right answer. <laughs> I think you could unmute yourself if you're dying to share a letter Y with us for feasibility study. Hey Matthew, the only thing I can come up with is youthfulness. Laura, did That's you have a Y just, for us? You look like yeah, you're about to say something. I did youthfulness. Not so much. Well, thank you for rejoining us at 740. The challenge remains to all of us to embrace the objectives and make them our own, make the outcomes of this study what we embrace. I'm excited to join you guys on that. And um, it's 740, Rustin, so I think we can go ahead and reconvene. Very good. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, before we move on, are there any other uh, questions? I'll, I'll give this a minute or two, and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we can certainly finish on time, but. Any other last questions before we move to the next subject? I had one quick, quick one. Yes, Marita. Yes. Um, so, go, go, regarding all of the that cost analysis, um, is it too early to ask what the um, like? Is it just going to be a general monthly fee, kind of like when you join the Y? Are, are uh, we thinking that that's what it'll be like? It, it's it's still a little early to answer that okay. one. That answer is going to be coming. Uh, okay. sure. uh, part of it comes down to just operational costs and 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 the, the funding mechanism on that. But uh, so too early to answer is still a very good okay. question, though. 
And then Linda, I see you have your hand raised. Linda, if you have a question, I think you're on mute. So um, let us know. Um, yes, there we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No problem. I should have. Okay. If I'm one of the ones that hasn't signed the document that you need, uh, will you send it to me again so that I can sign it and send it back? If I'm not, I won't worry about it, but I don't remember seeing it. All right. Uh, actually, so Matthew, that's probably, uh, since you're, you're the receiver of those, uh, can you maybe resend to those that, that have turned it in yet? Great. Thanks, Linda. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we're going to see. We're going to go ahead and move on here. Um, this next conversation, we're going to spend some time on here. Um, part of what um, feasibility studies include is uh, site location, and um, we are very intentionally talking about site criteria tonight. We are also very specifically not talking about specific sites. Um, there's been an ongoing look at available sites, uh, information that's come from both cities. Um, we've looked at 20 different sites already, uh, but what we want to do here is establish the priorities through a criteria, a weighted criteria system on a, a site analysis form. And what I sent to you uh, was the scoring basis. Uh, we've got 21 different criteria, and, and this comes from just uh, having uh, done a number of these, at the same time, we are absolutely open to your input on anything that you think ought to be added to this list. So we're gonna uh, click through these uh, scoring basis uh, items. And then we're gonna show you the score sheet and how this weighted criteria question starts to, to land and uh, to get your feedback on that as well. Um, what we want to avoid is, um, as much subjectivity and um, I'll just call it uh, emotion uh, attached to sites. We need to be as absolutely subjective, excuse me, as objective as we can in, in looking at these sites. And we're gonna score them uh, after we've gotten them down to a, a shorter list and then share all that with you. So you can start to see which ones appear to be the most favorable from looking at all these different criteria and ultimately, you know, figure out which sites we want to develop further uh, and land the program at, that we're working on at the same time, start to land that on, on property. And again, it's a process of really needing to stick a stake in the ground as a point of beginning, and then we can circle back. Uh, this is uh, somewhat of a linear process, but it's also iterative at times, meaning we need to circle back and retest and refocus on things that we've decided early on in the process. We are absolutely open to doing that if there's good reason. At the end of the day, we have to have a very defendable result uh, the, in a feasibility study that says yay or nay for, for these reasons. And so what we've given you here is a, a list. Um, it's broken into four different categories. That first category is really just basic site conditions. It's basic things like, is it big enough? Um, is there capacity on this property to expand this building in the future? We always, whatever we're designing is always a phase one. Uh, there's always potential for phase two. Let's, let's be thinking about that. The context uh, that the site is in, um, what those adjacent uses are, uh, if there's you know, cram rates, tr transient paths, whatever the issues might be. And that was one that we can probably drill into a little bit more. The visibility and the prominence of the site, probably really important in a community asset like this. Um, adjacent land uses, are there land uses that we really would like to see this next to? That's part of the judgment that we would use in scoring uh, of a site. Topography is a, basically a fancy word for is it, is it flat or is it sloped? Uh, these big buildings really like flat sites. Uh, it's more cost effective, but we'll take a look at that. If it's sloped, but it's sloped in a certain way and it can still work, uh, we can certainly take that into consideration. Uh, and then the basic soils subsurface conditions. It may be an ideal site, but if it's a if it's a bog, if it's a wetland, there's issues like that that really start to impact cost to development of that property. 
that needs to be taken into consideration. And uh, just some, some details from our civil engineer on some of the things to look for and, and to avoid. The second section is in talking about infrastructure. And this is a lot about cost. Um, is there access to the utilities that we're going to need? Um, as soon as you put in an aquatic facility, that, that's a, a pretty heavy load on utilities. And if they're in place, you know, adjacent to the property, great. If they're not, that's gonna score lower because it's gonna be a, a much larger cost uh, to bring those services in. Uh, existing frontage improvements. Um, hopefully we don't have to do a lot with that. We don't wanna spend budget on sidewalks in that, but maybe we do. Again, we take a look at that existing condition and, and weight that criteria. From water management, utility incentives, there's a lot of different components that we want to make part of this formula and part of this assessment uh, as we're looking at these properties. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. So then we get into more of the vehicular and pedestrian accessibility. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, the importance of connectivity to trails, you know, to uh, pedestrian, other types of pedestrian pathways, multimodal access, um, transit. Um, so traffic impact costs, all those things we'll definitely be taking a look at. Um, in terms of uh, parking capacities or a chance to share parking with adjacent uses, uh, we really hate to put in lots of paving if we don't have to. It's got to be functional. It's got to support the facility, but if we can do shared uh, access, that's a benefit to uh, a site if, if those existing conditions are there. And then finally, the anticipated costs um, really directly related to who owns the land. Uh, if it's already a, a county asset, it's already a city asset, that's one thing. If it's privately owned, that's something else. And so uh, we'll be working with our consultant on this. Uh, by the way, the land uh, analysis consultant is CBRE uh, out of Tacoma. They're the ones that have been looking at all the different properties. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing from them at the next meeting on the, that process and some of those uh, results, uh, findings uh, for your uh, your input. Uh, impact fees, uh, those are going to vary depending on, on municipality, excuse me, and, uh, and just site location. Developing uh, on-site costs, off-site costs, uh, and, and site-related scheduling phasing, if that is driven by some existing condition or, or adjacent use. So it's a pretty comprehensive list, and uh, all these things are important. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the matrix and then we're gonna circle back and, and test uh, some of these different ideas and see what uh, all you have been thinking about uh, regarding site analysis. Again, I don't want you to think about any particular sites. I want you to think more generally about how would you assess one site versus another site versus another site for the betterment and for the good of the property and the project and the program ultimately when we finally get that uh, defined. So the way this uh, evaluation worksheet is, um, we have all those criteria that I just described to you on the left-hand side, and then we have a criteria weight. That weight is what is more important than what else. Just because we have 21 does not mean each one of those is the same importance or the same priority or should be given the same amount of consideration as the others. So we need to agree on weighting each of these different criteria, one relative to the next. And when we do that, you can kind of see we've got site number one there and site number two. As soon as we start scoring each site, one relative to the other, you can kind of see where those, those scores start to then adjust because of the, the importance of that particular line item. Uh, what we will do is um, CBRE will do some scoring, ALSC will do scoring. We also have Kaufman Engineering doing the civil uh, analysis of this, they will score. We will all do those independently and then kind of combine uh, our thoughts. And then we're gonna present those to you for your thoughts uh, once we've got uh, a little bit further down the road here at the next meeting. So tonight, the real focus is on that criteria weight column and all the criteria that we're listing on the left-hand side. I know this is a little dry and, I, and I'm sorry for that, but it's really critical that we do this now before we start uh, giving consideration to specific sites. So, um, what you see in the criteria weight, this is, uh, consider these are suggestions um, 
but this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time really talking about one relative to the other. What's more important to you in considering a piece of property to site an indoor recreation facility? It's really, that, that's pretty much the long and short of it. So what is most important? What is not as important? And we're going to just go through these one at a time. Uh, you can kind of see the, uh, in terms of the site conditions, uh, the adequacy of developing the site, uh, making sure it's, it's large enough. Obviously, we've given that uh, the, the maximum two uh, weight on the criteria. It, it's got to be big enough. That if it's not, it's really not even going to be given any further consideration. So that's really important. Um, that capacity for future expansion, we're, we're saying that's about a 1.2. Um, it's important, uh, but it's not really one of the, the main drivers. Uh, it, it probably is not as important and as high a priority as perhaps some of these other criteria. Um, so we'll go through 1A through G, and then uh, I'll invite your input on, on that piece, and then we'll move to the next section. Rustin, um, real quick, I think Jim might have a question. So before okay. we start jumping into it, Jim? Okay, Jim. Let me unmute here. Okay, um, I hate to say this, but I think we put the cart before the horse. Um, unless somebody's gonna write a check, but I think our citizens are gonna have to pay for this thing. And I don't think they're gonna wanna go into un unincorporated King County. I, don't, I believe Jeff might be able to answer this, but as a past councilman, I don't think we can ask people to pay taxes on something we don't own. Maybe Jeff knows, but uh, I think uh, the criteria has to be two locations, one in Covington and one in Maple Valley, so we can fund these things. If we don't put them in the city, I don't know how we're going to fund them. That's it. And one of the, just to, to uh, re reply to at least a portion of that, uh, part of our charge from the, the core planning group is we need to bring to you sites that are in the city of Covington and are in the, the uh, city of Maple Valley, and we do have sites that will do that. What we're trying to do is make sure we haven't missed any other opportunities. But yes, absolutely, you know, anything outside of that or private property is going to have a cost to it. And that becomes part of the feasibility study. And again, obviously, it's probably not likely that it would go that way, but uh, we need to do our due diligence and make sure the sites that we land on in, in, the, in the city will work and, and, and support the, the program. So it's an excellent point, though. I'm glad you brought it up. OK, so let's keep going through our, our site conditions here. Um, safety and security, uh, that's a 1.5. That's a, a pretty, uh, pretty heavy weight. That's obviously critically important to us. Um, incidentally, this criteria weight, one low, two high, uh, some folks might think that seems a little tight. Um, we actually do that on purpose. Um, we want to make sure that we aren't so far uh, out there uh, on weighted criteria that it starts to skew the numbers and, and make something look way more attractive than, than perhaps it is overall. So we intentionally keep them pretty tight. So the scores do not vary a whole lot, but they do start to bring sites to the top. Um, and again, at the end of the day, we want this to be a very defendable process and result. Uh, that we can fall back on the, the uh, you know, fully vetted uh, process that's looked at, at all these different things. Adjacent land use context, we're saying that's a, that's a 1.0. Uh, that, that's, it's uh, not one of the highest priorities. Topography about 1.5, it may or may not be depending on what the site is. If it's super sloped, it's not gonna score very well anyway. Um, and uh, otherwise if it's flat, it'll score really well. And then finally, those soils conditions, that's about a 1.6 because you can build on just about anything. You can engineer about anything, but it does translate into cost. So, so with that first section, does anyone have a strong feeling on any of these weights? Too high, too low, seems okay. Um, again, these are, it's, it's guiding a process it, it, to get, you know, add, add more decimal points or whatever really isn't valuable. It's uh, helping us to do a first cut at, at, at sites and understand which ones are make the most sense to move forward. So questions on that? Yes, uh, this is Les Burberry. Yes, Les. Um, 
the all of the items seem very objective except for item uh, C and D. Um, and I'm just wondering how that's going to be uh, measured. Is there any um, any objective uh, you know means that you can bring into those two items? Uh, yeah, the, the, the text uh, that we went over just a moment ago puts a little bit more meat on the bones, so to speak, in terms of these different criteria. Um, we're going to do our very best to be as objective as we can on our scoring, and then we'll explain what we did and why uh, when we bring those two forward. But you're right. Of all of this, those two are, are there, there's some subjectivity to that. And when we're doing that scoring, we're definitely going to be working with our core planning group and getting uh, any other insights on uh, answering uh, really any of these uh, criteria. But uh, we'll be very transparent in why we've scored things and you'll see all of that and have an opportunity to say, eh, this instead of that. Other, other questions? I think no, the last one I have, just, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think Les, uh, Brock maybe now has one. Okay, so I thought that um, C, safety and security context, should have a little bit higher weighting. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking that this would be a place where um, adults would take their children and elderly would be going there. But you also have the uh, young teens in the you know, the mid-teens that would be potentially going there by themselves. And I, I would make sure that this is a safe area even more than other items that are on that list. I think that's probably one of the most important is that it's a, in a safe area and that we trust um, the ability to let our kids go there on their own possibly, um, you know, if they're, if they're driving, yes, specifically, and uh, make sure that it's, um, a safe area. So I, I think that needs to be a little bit higher on the on the weight. Okay. Thanks. All right, we'll definitely take a look at that. And part of the reason it, it, it's landed where it was is, as was noted earlier, that one's a little bit hard to quantify, but I, I absolutely am hearing you and certainly safety is, is critical. So we will definitely revisit that one. And then Russ, we have uh, three more questions. So Laura. I am very comfortable with the weights on all of them, except uh, B, the capacity for future expansion, just kind of triggered a question in my mind, uh, given how you've commented that whatever you build is always a phase one, and given the numerous comments from the community in the survey, don't build it too small, make sure that it serves the community, make sure we can expand it. Perhaps we might wanna consider ticking that weight up just a little bit. Yeah, I think that's that's very reasonable. Part of what we've seen in the in the past in, in having done these, number one, uh, it will be too small the day you open. <laughs> it, they always are because we always hit, hit the funding wall that, and we stretch those dollars as far as we can, uh, but it'll be too small. The other side of it is how long it might take before more funding would be available to add on to it. And so that that's, Again, this one's kind of testing that that question. Uh, do you think it will, uh, you know, down the road expand? Uh, we can certainly take that 1.2 up higher, though. I'll take it lower. I mean, I wouldn't invite other community uh, members, not community, but uh, committee members to agree or disagree with me on that. Um, I just wanted to bring that up as a point that we might look at. I'm definitely not wedded to the idea of making it higher, but wanted to point that out as a, a potential. This is Les Burberry. And yeah, I would certainly second that thought that that uh, capacity uh, does hold a lot of, of uh, clout. Okay. This is Monty. I was going to echo that saying, you know, you don't want something that's going to be obsolete in a few years. And so you always want to think about expansion, um, especially when it's going to be such 
an expensive project in five years, you don't want people to be like, well, this is not what we wanted. And maybe we want something else now. So, you know, just taking into that account. And then also commenting on C with safety. I think it was one of the things that um, folks in the survey were saying is like safety is their number one thing. So I would definitely want us to look at that as well. Okay. All right, very good, thank you. And then, um... Maria has a question as well, and then Jeff. Yeah, um, so I actually had raised my hand separately, Laura, to talk about um, B as well. So I, I feel the same way um, that it should be weighted higher um, because just in my job, every time we talk about create, you know, building something, we're like, okay, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner. I feel like right now it's easy to ignore because we we don't have anything yet. So we're just excited to get the phase one. Um, but I, I really strongly feel like we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot if we didn't weight that a little higher. Like even the Y, somebody mentioned the Y in Pierce County, the, the Sumner YMCA is um, used a lot by the residents of the community we're building. And it's a fabulous Y, but even they need, just had to buy more land next door because they didn't have anything for outdoor recreation at all. So they had to go through the process of purchasing the land and, you know, it, and all of that. So if you can think ahead, about that ahead of time, um, I think it'd be, it just makes everything easier later down the road. Okay. So we'll, let's take one more question in this section and then we're going to, we're going to move on to the next one. Drew, you said you had one more? Yeah. Jeff uh, Wagner. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I am in agreement on item B, uh, capacity for future expansion. Um, a lot of the YMCA's and other uh, community centers, pools, have, will build, even the hospitals, will build a bigger shell on their property for future interior expansion down the road, leaving parts of the building open. So we need to consider that. So I'd like to see the capacity um, a little bit higher than the 1.2 that you have there. Okay, very good. Well, we will uh, we will make a, a appropriate adjustments to, to both of those and we'll show those to you with uh, some of that scoring at, at the next meeting then. So great, good discussion and a lot of consistency on that feedback, thank you for that. Let's go ahead and slide down Drew to number two on the infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> Access to utilities adjacent to the site, um, given as a as a 1.3. This really just does purely come down to to, to cost. Um, the cost as a percentage of the overall project is why these aren't aren't scored super high. Uh, but again, we can uh, talk about any one of these existing frontage improvements. Again, if if we need to add a sidewalk, okay, it, it's it's not a, a huge deal, but it's something worth. Uh, uh, considering because it does uh, have an impact on cost. Stormwater management, uh, it's important to understand that, but it's uh, a pretty uh, pretty typical uh, approach, uh, we think, uh, on most of these sites. If we're finding that's not the case, if we're into some pretty specific storm detention, that can start really racking up some site costs. So that, that could potentially get increased. If we're finding that, we're just not at this point anticipating that, that we would be. And then city incentives that that again there's there's uh, the potential that that may have a, a, a benefit on one site versus the next 1.2 it, it's not necessarily a huge swing but one that we wanted to identify as a as a potential positive so comments or questions on those four And then Russ, and real quick, I know Chris had a question and he had his hand up right at the very end there, the last uh, round, and then Rosie has a question. Okay, Chris? Yeah, so um, I love the conversation about future expansion. I, I will be the, uh, the voice on the other side because I think we always have to have that a little bit, right? Um, which is, uh, I always come at these things through that lens of trade-offs at the end of the day. Um, and if this came down to a final thing where we were saying we could either have capacity for future expansion or we can build a bigger facility today. 
Um, and that's where I start to deprioritize future expansion in a world of constrained resources, right? Um, I totally agree with the, with the rate that we're growing that, you know, considering capacity and future expansion is important, but we're gonna reach that point where you are talking about trade-offs. And when I look at this list, I'm not willing to trade off security. I'm not willing to trade off a lot of these other things. The one thing I could be convinced to trade off um, for example, is capacity, you know, uh, for the future, you know, in order to get the capacity I need today. Um, just wanted to bring that up as another kind of viewpoint as we think about this, we still should look at the number. All right. Great, Chris, thank you very much. And who was the, the other one, Drew? Rosie, did you say? Rosie, yes. Yeah, Rosie. Yes, thank you. Um, my comment is regarding access to utilities. Um, and I'm just wondering if we could have some discussion on whether or not that number potentially should be a bit higher, um, just because I've had clients with projects where, um, particularly with sanitary sewer, they were not adjacent to a sanitary sewer connection and the cost to bring that in um, was exorbitant and project killing. And so um, and that's obviously not the case at every site and it's different among different jurisdictions, um, but I would just, question if maybe we could raise that slightly um, okay. just from a cost standpoint it it could add a lot of cost to add that okay. in sure yeah, and we'll absolutely uh, take a look at that P part of what um, we're anticipating uh, and again right or wrong and we're, we're willing to circle back on, on any of this what we're anticipating is if there's a site that doesn't have some of those basic utilities it probably doesn't even make it to the next round of, of access and what, so what we're looking at is, you know, the, the ones that do, are, is there additional work that's going to have to be done to, to get connections made in that? But you make a good point. Uh, so we've highlighted that one and we'll, we'll circle back on that one as well. Thank you. Any other uh, questions on uh, infrastructure uh, to A through D? Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on again. We'll circle back as needed. Uh, Next one is going to take a little, little bit of, little bit of conversation. Uh, vehicular and pedestrian accessibility, um, traffic impact issues, and again, we would, if there's going to be a, a, a level of service issue um, based on where this site just happens to be, we just want to track that. And again, it, it's just potentially a cost impact if we're looking at signalization, pedestrian crossings, a new uh, intersection uh, signal. You know, that can start to add up, which is why we've given it a, a more than a one weight, we've given it a 1.4. Uh, pedestrian and bike access, again, it's, it's important. It, it's uh, one that we can talk about a little bit more uh, in terms of that, that importance to that connectivity to, to trails and things. And certainly some sites are going to be much more conducive to that than others. Um, transit availability, uh, we're imagining that the sites we're gonna be looking at probably all have it. Uh, if they don't, that, that's a criteria we're gonna to have to look back uh, and see. Uh, again, if they're in the city and they're in the right locations and we're within an uh, X amount of distance, um, that one could easily be increased uh, somewhat, but uh, we're again, making some assumptions to just begin this conversation, obviously. Vehicular access is huge. Um, access comes up over and over and over again. Uh, folks just being able to drive to it easily and, and, and get out of it easily. So that's why that's a 1.8. And then again, parking has been brought up over and over again as well. And it's a, uh, it's a big issue. So that's why we've given that one a two. So uh, comments or questions on those five criteria. Uh, we have, have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. No. Go going to say go Allison I think that's you or I need to raise my hand <laughs> <laughs> I just want to um, reiterate Rustin what you commented on about the transit availability and how I would support increasing that um, a little bit higher as being a need okay uh, to be looking at somewhat equal to the other ways that um, community members will be accessing this okay And then we have Laura Morrissey. So I had also not quite as specific, but similar thoughts as Jim in that given so much of the information in the survey and the concerns of travel distance, like some 
people in the survey commented on how the Covington Aquatic Center was so far away and so remote, um, which I found kind of interesting because it's really only a 15 minute drive from almost any location in Covington or Maple Valley. I'm wondering if we should consider some type of weight that's in terms of relative location from the two cities, but I'm also unsure if it might be a little premature for that because we haven't defined a service area yet. Um, I don't quite know how to define that any further. Maybe some of the other committee members might help refine that or Rustin, you might a little bit, but that does seem to be an issue that came up in both the survey and it's kind of a conscious or subconscious thing in the group. Um, everybody kind of wants it in their own city, which nobody really wants to talk about. And we are here to build consensus, but the fact is that we do want it close in. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. And uh, certainly we're not going to be uh, giving any weight to which, which city it's in. Uh, we, at the same time, again, making some assumptions that anything that's gonna qualify as kind of this short list of, of sites that we would wanna do scoring, that, that that's kind of a given, uh, but we can certainly look at making sure that there's a, a criteria specific to that. Uh, we may modify one that's already here, but I, I, I'm hearing you and we'll absolutely give that some consideration. Yeah, either is fine, um, just because it has come up so often in the survey and it's just one of those things that's kind of out there in the community, I wanted to bring it up. Sure, no, excellent point, thank you. Then I think we have uh, Arita again. All right. Uh, on traffic impact issues A there, can you explain the, the four equals minimum impact? I thought this was a scale of one to two. So obviously that means something else. So yeah, the, um, the, the weighting is, is one to two. But when we actually go through and score each of these, we're going to give it a score of anywhere from one to four. So that next column oh, is going to gotcha. get a one to four in it. And then that gets multiplied by the weighting for, a, for an overall score for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, okay. So and none of these take into potential mitigations, right, that might come up into play. Um, depending on where the site is and whether we have to, to, you know, like you said earlier, put signals in or add lanes or anything like that, because that adds up in cost, obviously, as well. Yeah, and it's it's in here in a, a couple of different places. The okay. um, terms of traffic impact issues, um, that's part of it. Also, down in the next section that we're going to be talking about on the on-site development costs and, and subsurface oh. conditions, those kinds of things. So it's it's in here in a couple of different places. But it's really okay. important to talk about it because you're. It is. It gets very expensive exactly right. and 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 time and time consuming. And they also yep. wanted to just put my support behind Rosie's comment on this previous section about the access to utilities because that will really affect cost as well. You bet. Um, so just put my. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on section three before we move on? We're getting getting close to wrapping it up here. All right, let's go I slide. I think you have another question. I just don't think you've unraised your hand, but just want to make sure. Thank you. All right, so let's go down to the last section here. And this really is just drilling into some uh, other potential uh, uh, you know, associated costs. Um, and it was brought up earlier, obviously land acquisition has to be considered. Again, it's not likely we will be looking at a, a site that would have to be purchased, but we want to leave that uh, opportunity open. And if so, it, it carries a, a heavier weight um, uh, in, in terms of a, a, you know, a, an issue <laughs> uh, regarding uh, uh, whether or not that, that's going to be a cost component or not. Um, impact fees, uh, something we want to look at and consider just from a straight scoring standpoint. We don't necessarily see that as a huge weight. But again, I wanted to get that out there for, for conversation. On-site and off-site, those are kind of catch-alls. Um, on-site is, is usually you know, fairly manageable. If it's not, it's probably not going to be on the short list to be, be looked at. But the off-site development costs, 
And that's part of where we're looking at utilities also. Uh, so we're looking at it from a couple of different standpoints. Uh, that's why it's a 1.4 because as was pointed out earlier, if we don't have utilities or looking at running a gas line forever or whatever it might be, we need to make sure we're tracking uh, that. And then finally, this one is a little bit obscure and it, it may not apply at all, but we've run into this before or because of what's there or where the site is located, um, adjacent uses, sometimes that drives a phased approach, which drives cost, which is why uh, it's on here. It, it, again, it's not necessarily a huge cost issue, so we left it as just a 1.0. Um, and then the difference would be just in the straight scoring of that. So costs, uh, you know, A through E under item four, questions or comments on that? I have a, I don't know if it's a question or or changing the weighting of it, but under uh, relative land acquisition costs, are you also, I mean, you've brought up about that it's already owned by the city or government. Are you also considering in that land acquisition costs a public private partnership with a local developer? Would that be weighted in there or is it somewhere else that it's gonna get weighted? It, it would most likely land there. Uh, and again, that, that's, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not leaving any stone unturned yet and, and, and throwing those things out. I'm not aware of any of those from CBRE yet, but uh, there's no more work to do there. Uh, where that potentially is an impact is on the cost. And what we would do, that's a, a 1.5 weight. We'll also, in, in terms of the scoring of those different sites, but take that into consideration as well. Is that... That's sort of a, a, an odd <laughs> uh, answer for you, but that's how this typically works. And I just uh, taking that into consideration, you bet. Perfect. I just want to make sure because there is the possibilities out there that, which, you know, we may not have heard it. There may not be, but there is in other areas where other community centers have been built, there has become public private partnerships to help reduce the cost to the public. Um, yeah. to help build an even bigger facility on the land. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at everything still and in, in, in starting to pare them down, but uh, we'll show you everything that was looked at. So great. Other comments on this one? Marita has another question. All right. Sorry. No, that's fine. Yes, I do. Um, the impact fees, so line B there, I'm just wondering if that should be weighted a little higher. And I don't know if it needs to be or not. I'm, I'm genuinely not asking the question. Um, my question is coming from the vantage point of, do you, is it possible that a site we chose may get us into a situation where we have to mitigate something for the county or the state even? Because when those start layering up, then it can get really pricey. But mm -hmm. if that's not a possibility, then maybe a one time. Well, it's, uh, yeah, again, what that would probably primarily show up on is just how, what the straight scoring of that site would be based on what we know at the time. And to be, uh, to be honest, we are, we have not yet given this full consideration because we don't know yet exactly where all the sites are. Once we do, that's going to be one of those criteria. And we may come back and say, based on specifically your comments here, Based on what we have found, that's a that's a bigger weight than we thought, and we will make okay. that adjustment and show you that. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, I, that that's that was actually another question whether these could adjust. So that that makes me oh, yeah. better with the yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, thanks for the reminder. This is a, definitely an, an iterative process. If once we go through this, if we're seeing, boy, what we thought uh, were going to be the, the biggest issues aren't, and what we didn't think issues were are we're going to go back and revisit this with you because at the end of the day we really want something that's um that is based on uh on you know the, the most objective things that we can find and part of that objectivity is what we're actually seeing on you know in the dirt uh and so we may again adjust these a little bit just to make sure we're we got a good defendable uh, process going so yeah we reserve the right so to speak to uh, circle back so. 
All right. Well, uh, let's bring that to a, to a close. Thank you. That was really informative for us. I appreciate that. That's going to help inform our, our process here in the next uh, several weeks as we're, we're continuing to work. So with that on our agenda, uh, we've got, uh, let's see, eight minutes left. And uh, so what I would like to do is just, I'm going to touch very lightly on our, our next steps here and allow anyone that has a, a, a last question or two to get those in before our, our we close. Um, so what's coming up? I've already mentioned it a little bit. Lots of work in programming, defining the scope, continuing to read our, our surveys, taking into consideration a lot of your comments on specifically on who are we asking? Can we get more demographics? Uh, we will be putting a lot of weight on the statistically valid survey because it's statistically valid uh, the other components are, are are adding information, but they they don't carry quite the weight that the statistically valid survey does. Uh, but we're going to consider everything, and we're continuing to leave that open. Uh, the the online surveys are going to continue open. We're going to continue to collect, and continue to study and 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 consider that because, I mean, feedback's a gift, and that's what we're looking for. We want everyone to have an opportunity to take a shot at this and then share that in the, the best way we can with all of you. Uh, so we're giving this absolute due, due diligence. But that next meeting, we're gonna be talking a lot more about what we have found and what we've seen in the past, what some of those cost, uh, you know, revenue versus cost operations signatures start to look like and start to help kind of prioritize what are we, what are we after here uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. And that'll be a lot easier when we have more information for you the next time. Um, so that really covers the, the current desires and, and priorities as well. Those are all gonna be discussed at our, our, that next meeting based on our, our findings. We are not making any recommendations yet. We're just sharing findings and our opinions of things for you to consider and act on. We'll also be looking a little bit more at that business plan uh, using that, that criteria, that, that uh, three-way chart that we showed you on based on what the facility spaces that type is what what generates revenue more so than than what what does not what's got a higher operation cost and, and what does not just to give for you to give consideration to and again that's going to start pushing you a little bit on what's what's more important you know minimizing the subsidy or providing you know what what is most strongly requested by the, the community and obviously that's your priority but that starts to potentially limit you know what what this scope can be so it's a it's a very interesting process i think you're going to enjoy that next next round and with the information we're going to share with you so that's what's coming uh we've got just a couple more minutes any final thoughts or questions anyone on this call russ and christina has a her hand up so oh. christina and you mentioned earlier that you had about 20 locations that you you were looking at i don't want to jump ahead of you Christina, I can barely hear you. Sorry, is this any better? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned that you had about 20 locations that you were looking at, and I don't want to jump ahead of everything, and we have a well-established set of criteria, um, but is this something that you will be bringing to us so that we can then choose from? Um, I know the criteria, uh, I, again, it's well established, so it's going to weed out what we cannot use. However, the possible sites, is that going to be brought to us? So what, what you're gonna see at the next meeting is, here, here's the properties, we're gonna show you the map. Here, here's where all of them were. Here's the ones that, that made the cut based on, on these criteria that we've been talking about. And here's the handful. It's gonna be probably four to six sites and we will have already scored those and show that to you and then open that up for discussion uh, because you may not necessarily agree with how we've scored things. Um, we are doing it as objectively as we can. And again, being from out of town is a, an advantage uh, in, in some ways, as long as we have good information on the, the objective things, utilities and that, and that's you know in our scope to make sure we have fully vetted as well. So yeah, we are gonna be very transparent with all of this and, and hopefully get your buy-in on what we've done and then we'll make whatever tweaks are necessary to, to move to the next step. Great, other questions, Drew? 
I'm not seeing any at this time. Oh my goodness, really? We got four minutes left. <laughs> oh, Brock's got a question. Okay, so we you showed a map a little while back with the circles, a circle on it in the different colors. And there is a pinpoint as to the center of that. Um, do you recall that? Yes. Yeah. Bring that up, please, if, if you can. You bet. Um, yep. Hold on. And I know Russ and Matthew also wants to discuss schedule here before the end. So. Um, oh, yes. Thank you. Out, I just want to point out um, there's a there was a pin there to show the distance away from that area, 15 minute drive, I think it was. What what fa what decided where that pin would go? That um, red boundary, 15 minute drive time from the midpoint pin. Sure, Scott, you want to handle that one? Point right in the middle. I mean, it, there was <laughs> there was not anything. Uh, really that uh that determined it we just picked a picked a spot uh, right there so um there's was, there's was nothing magical about it so okay so we, again we'd be we'd be happy to move that to where it's more appropriate but we put i can't remember what the highway is um uh, that that runs up up this uh the northwest here but uh or northeast, but uh, that's basically we just picked the route because we felt that that was the most um, uh, accessible as far as uh, traffic wise. So, okay, is that Highway 18? That I'm just I'm just thinking, you know, you're going to give us some options of where this facility would be could be. Um, that's going to change this whole map, right? Because wherever we decide to put this you, this facility is gonna change what the distance to all the different areas, right? All the, that pin's gonna move. I, it, correct, and, and, right. and that's kind of one of the reasons why what we feel is one of the best ways to be able to, to determine what your service area is, is that hand-drawn area, um, because that, that encompasses for the most part, most of that 15 minute drive time. Um, and if we, again, if we could shift it a little bit east, west, north, south, whatever direction, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think it's gonna change dramatically. Uh, there will be some, but it's, it's really not gonna change dramatically. So that's why, again, a lot of times we do the, the hand-drawn just because it, it does get the, a, a larger base there. Okay, and then one further point, um, when the locations have been looked at, or if there's a list of locations, those locations just exist inside of Covington and Maple Valley, or did you go outside uh, potentially, you know, I mean, I'm biased to Black Diamond, obviously, but did you go outside of um, the, the Maple Valley Covington area, or was it only inside those areas? Yeah, there there are, are some that are, are outside, but it, you're, what you're going to see is it's fairly focused. Um, and, it, and that's why Scott's saying that pin, it, it'll move and we'll move it when we are, are further along with that analysis, but not likely going to move very far because we're not looking at sites that are anywhere near the perimeter of, in this diagram of like that yellow circle. We're not way, way outside of that. We're, we're, we're in the center of it somewhere. But we'll show you where all of those are at the next meeting. Okay. Well, Matthew, I know you wanted to talk dates for meetings, so can I kick it back to you? Yeah, thanks very much, and I appreciate everybody staying on so long today and your patience with that. Um, I got to I have to applaud Brock and Jim and others who brought up critical comments and said, but what about this and what about that? I really do think we need to hear those points of view. And Laura brought up that complication of, well, don't we need a service area first? And I think you guys are stumbling into the issues that are at hand, like, who are we serving? And then overlay that with how accessible is a site to who we are serving? Who are we serving? You already heard that might take some more market analysis for what different um, kinds of programs speak to people, right? So it is hard at this point. I just commiserate with you because it's kind of like all these grays and loaded them all up, but you have already proven you can handle it. 
um, here we are two and a half hours in. So looking to your next meeting, um, we heard from the steering committee members that the third Tuesday and the third Thursday of the month were generally the best. We also saw that on city calendars um, as good opportunities. So in November, you are scheduled for the third Tuesday. That happens to be November 17th. And I have been asking you guys if you have some conflicts to let me know. I'm not saying on the spot right now because we're wrapping this up, but we definitely have already weighed and said, oh, we can't have you miss more than two. So we definitely are watching closely if you think you're going to be missing one. And then if we had to reschedule, but you're scheduled for the third Tuesday again, the 17th of November, same time, 6 to 830. And we also have in November in our schedule, the opportunity to have a public workshop. And working with the consultants, they've told us when they make sense before and after a steering committee meeting. And so in this instance in November, they are looking at one after your steering committee meeting. So when they think about what you're accomplishing in your next steering committee meeting, then they wanna bring it to the public. So we have in November, your meeting on Tuesday, the third Tuesday and a proposal to have the public workshop either that same week, just two days later on the 19th, or to give ourselves um, a full week and do it on the 24th. You can't go to Thursday because that's Thanksgiving. So basically it's a question on that public meeting workshop that we could either do it two days after your steering committee meeting on the 19th or wait till the Tuesday, the 24th. The 24th presents a conflict with the Covington City Council and our council members, especially who are on the steering committee would probably have to excuse themselves or come and go a bit that night. It is a possibility, but I wanna tell you that we haven't heard of conflicts for the third Thursday. So November could be a, kind of a busy third week for you if you are able to attend both steering committee on the 17th and a public workshop on the 19th. You would not be required at the public workshop, but clearly I think you'd be interested. So that's, I put it out there and um, I've talked too much, but I'm just, um, I, I just can't wait to put out your anagram for all your words that you've brought to me. And I think you should take great pride in who you are and what you said tonight. Um, I still need a why, remember feasibility study ends with a why. So that is out there for either a fun final uh, comment from any of you or just a private email to me and I'll make sure that anagram gets out. But uh, thank you very much. And let's plan on uh, obviously being together on the third Tuesday of November, the 17th at six. And then we'll find out if you have conflicts on the Thursday, the 19th, or have other observations about the right time to have the public workshop. And Marita, I just saw your, your, your note pop up. That was our thought too, which is why we were proposing it on the 19th. We just wanted to stay off the holiday as far as we could. All right. Well, again, thank you all so much. Uh, it's been a great session. We've we've gained a lot from this. I hope you have too. Uh, more information on the way. We'll get it to you early uh, prior to our next uh, steering committee meeting. And uh, with that, I hope you all have a, a great evening. And uh, we'll uh, we'll all see how the debate has gone. I suppose um, at the national level. But with that, uh, take care. Be safe. Uh, stay healthy. And we'll see you. Uh, at the next steering committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Will there be minutes sent? Will yeah. Will anyone send minutes of today's discussion out? Yes, we will. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And Bye. we also had gotten a request to to get the the slides that we've used uh, tonight. We will put that together. <laughs> as a slide deck and, and send that to all the uh, steering committee members also. Perfect.